just a few examples, just two examples of the wisdom of this statement. First example, in the emperor has no clothes department, we have a great deal of discussion about the federal budget these days. And the budget of the state of California, and the budget of the University of California, and the budget of the University of California of Santa Cruz, and on and on. <laughs> and you will hear sentences about we don't have the money, we have unprecedented deficits, we must cut spending, and we have learned where the money goes. In 2006, this was the division of where the money goes, with 41% going to defense, and in 2009, the percentage of money spent on defense, so-called, quote-unquote, has gone up. All military spending is entirely discretionary, as opposed to other things that are required by statute, such as interest on payment on, on government debt. And therefore, over half of all the spending is military. Recently, interesting Freudian slip there in the first line, in typing, 708 billion in defense spending. That includes 159 billion for the ongoing operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan, as well as an additional 33 billion to spend 741 billion, which is a 3.4 percent increase from the last fiscal year. We have some ideas about where this might come from in terms of the Iron Triangle. And here's something I think that can sum, that sums it all up for me, Rob Will. Recently, the General Accounting Office has found that cost overruns, I'm not talking about spending, but cost overruns, what does that mean? That means a contractor gets a contract to build a weapon system, that contractor then uh, makes a pledge about the amount of money that it will cost, and then it turns out it costs a little more than that, and since these contracts are typically cost plus, that is, your profits are based on your costs, you can see the, the incentives to economize or perhaps not as strong as they might be, but look at this cost overruns, 296 billion, just cost overruns. That's very interesting to compare, a number to compare. Uh, by the way, one last thing. Pentagon spending today is 70%, 7-0 percent larger than it was in 2001. So the kinds of events that we're talking about in this class have had a massive impact, not only for the people of the region, not only for U.S. servicemen and women, not only for, but also for the spending patterns in the United States, the consequence economic, consequent economic consequences, these things have vast ripple effects that go throughout the political economy of this country, this state, the, and the world as a whole. Here's an interesting comparison with that $296 billion. This is the entire budget of the United States Department of Energy. We are talking over here an entire budget, notice that it has come down, an entire budget of 25 billion. Now, that's actually deceptive. We're actually spending less, but even if you take the whole budget, that's an order of magnitude, that is, divided by 10, an order of magnitude less than the sum of cost overruns in the pendant. Interesting to note. But we should actually, that's an underestimate of the disproportionate spending because this green portion here, if you read the little uh, here, is so-called defense. What's that? The Department of Energy spends a big chunk of its budget on nuclear warheads for the Pentagon. So you have to subtract that. You can see pretty clearly that the opportunity costs here are very large. We've known about this for a very long time. This is not news. I am not saying anything new. In fact, when I was younger than you were, you are now, there was a president of the United States who said exactly this. Dwight David Eisenhower, in his farewell address, simply pointed out the obvious opportunity cost of, these, of this kind of spending. Nevertheless, as Hannah Arendt said, nothing which was being done or nothing which is being done no matter how stupid, no matter how many people knew and foretold the consequences could be undone or prevented, or at least so it seems so far. So we're talking, we were talking last time, and we'll continue today, Thursday, and probably into early next week, about the political economy of oil. 
This is essential for making any sense out of the world. Anything in the world. Two basic modes of analysis. We're first developing a set of analytical tools which could be of interest in and of themselves, but are really more useful for telling, having useful analytical perspectives that we can then use to make sense out of the history of the international oil business. And that's what we're doing. Last time, we talked about the demand side. Well, understanding the demand side is critical. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition for making sense out of the political economy of international oil. We know that the United States has some basic features. What are the basic facts? We are about 25% of world consumption. It's that percentage is probably declining with the rise of consumption in Asia. But it's something like that. In 2007, it was 20.7 million barrels per day. You remember that barrels per day, barrel is the basic unit. Million barrels per day, MBD, is the basic way the international oil data is given. It fell because of the recession. Transportation chews up most of petroleum used in the U.S. The transportation share has been going up. Imports today are just under 13 million barrels. They're now 57% of consumption, and the import share has been steadily rising. These are fundamental facts that we need to have in the background of our minds to make sense out of American policy anywhere in the world with anything that where oil matters. The first analytical thing and the most important analytical component of making sense out of the demand side of oil is the concept of derived demand. There is no other concept that is as important as this one. It's critical because it suggests the burden of past history and past investments and past choices, but it also shows what might be possible for the future. A derived demand, remember, means that we don't want oil or coal, for that matter, for its own sake, unlike lighting or electricity, which we do want. We want these things because we're going to use them directly. Okay? We want oil only because we want movement, we want light, we want heat, we want things like that. And what that means is that the amount of oil that we want is shaped not only by how greedy we are to move around or how hot we want to keep our houses, things like that, but also by what is the technology that is used to translate from what we ultimately really want into the demand for oil. That is, it's just, that's what a derived demand of any kind. This is what we really want. When an economist would say what it is that gives utility, what appears in the utility function of a consumer. But that's, notice, oil is not over here. Oil's only derived because we want these things, then via technology, a demand for oil is created. A useful metaphor, very telling, from Amory Lovin, sums this up, cold beer and hot showers. That's the demand for oil. You could have said cold beer, hot showers, and, and some trips moving around. Right? That's what we want this stuff for. Now, that's the first idea. Second idea. If any time you talk about the demand of any commodity of any kind in economics, you know a couple of things. The first thing you know is that typically, the lower the price, the more people want to consume. And the more incomes they have, typically, the more of it they also want to consume. Therefore, the higher the price, the other things being equal, the less they want to consume. That is, quantity demanded is an inverse function of price. <coughs> So if prices go up, quantity demanded falls, which means that the quantity that we want <coughs> is responsive to the price. But, second idea, how responsive? To talk about that responsive, there's the notion of elasticity. That is to say, for any percentage change in price, by what percentage then does demand change? If, demand, if the price goes up by 100%, Maybe the quantity demanded only falls by 10%, in which case the elasticity, which is the ratio of those two percentages, could be 0.1. Always in economics, 
The responsiveness of consumers to price is a function of time. The longer time you give people to adapt, the more they will respond. Short run estimates and long run estimates of the own price elasticity of demand for oil bear this out. In the short run, they can be as low as 0 0.2, 0 0.4, which means if you get a 100% increase in price, the quantity demanded might fall between 20 and 40%. Okay? But if you give people five, six, seven, eight years, it can be a one-to-one -one change. This is because of the critical role of investment. After all, it's all a derived demand mediated by technology, and the development and installation of new technology takes time. So, if the price goes up and stays up, and people believe it will stay up, there will be investment, there will be change, there will be a decline in demand. Okay? There has to, notice I said, and people expect the price will stay up. Expectations of the future are obviously critical particularly when you're talking about investment. Every investor has to think about not just what's happening now, but what they think is likely to happen in the future. So that's really critical. And here, policy also matters hugely. You can see immediately why. We're going to see both today and, and this week that there are inherent structural features built into the international market for oil which guarantee price instability. It's really very simple. The demand function is highly inelastic. The supply function is equally so. Shocks either way, therefore, will create big changes in price, and those shocks are almost guaranteed given the political economy of the region where two-thirds of the reserves are found. So it's not very hard. So the price is likely to fluctuate around. Therefore, if you want, if we want, to send signals to consumers to do something else than guzzle oil, you must have public policies which don't simply rely on the gyrations because notice what those gyrations will do to investors. Investors will say, well, the price went way up, but do I really believe that's going to persist? In fact, if they look at the data, as we'll see when we start talking about the history of oil prices, they have many reasons to doubt that they will stay up. But if you have some kind of public policy that makes sure that the price stays up, then you might get investors to make those kinds of choices. What's happened in the U.S.? Increase in consumption and note, we'll talk more about this today, decline in production. And we will want to ask why. How is that explained and how, what implications might that have? We know the transportation share has gone up, and we know what we do in transportation. Light vehicles, heavy-duty trucks really drive the thing, drive the make are really the main impacts on, on the demand in transportation. So policies, technological innovations that affect automobiles, light trucks, and heavy semi-trucks are critical in terms of working on the demand side for uh, U.S. oil consumption. What are the incentives that people face? The first, there are two kinds of incentives. There can be incentives with respect to price, and there can be incentives with respect to specific kinds of technology. Let's look at those two. We did that. We said if we look at prices that consumers pay, which is the end of the graph around the world in relatively <coughs> rich countries and some other not so rich countries, we can see that since the price of crude oil, which is the blue, is determined in a global market, which is high, which once you get to the stage of trading of oil is highly competitive, which means that with a few small variations for transportation costs, the price of crude oil is the same everywhere in the world. And that's what is reflected here. Slight differences, but very little. But consumers pay very different prices around the world because, unlike Americans, shown down here on the second to the last bar, they pay much higher taxes for their petroleum. In terms of quantity regulation, since transportation is such a big deal, I mean, think about it this way. If transportation chews up about two-thirds of all of this, 
uh, of all of the oil in the country. And if light cars and trucks are at least half of that, we're talking fully a third of all the demand of oil in the U.S. is the result of cars. So clearly, given derived demand, the nature of how efficient the automobiles are that are manufactured will matter. What have we done? Bloody little until very recently compared to other questions. And this could matter. Projections show that increasing the efficiency of cars along with getting us to each uh, person not to drive so much could have a major consequence. But so far, so little. So far, we have done relatively little about this. And as a result, today, net imports are more than half of what we consume. Now, some people then jump from there to say, well, okay, now we're done. We can end uh, Environmental Studies 144, we can all go home, you know, Tuesday and Thursday mornings are nice times, we can be outside, maybe the weather gets better. So we can quit because now we know the stance in which we shed blood for oil. If we're importing all this and it's all in person, go, well then, that's why we're bombing. This is way too simple and it's easy to see why. In fact, we get about 12% of our total consumption from the Persian Gulf countries. So it isn't just that we are buying so much oil from them. It has to do with more complicated dynamics of the state and of the international oil business. That's what we need to think about. In fact, here's a useful, mo near, most of our oil, nearly half of it, comes from our neighbors in Canada, Mexico, and from the Venezuelans. That makes a lot of sense. Transportation costs are lower that way. And yes, we do get some of it, uh, but we don't get most of the total consumption of oil uh, from the Persian Gulf. Imports, go, the rise of import share is not difficult to explain. As long as consumption goes up and production, shown by this bellish shaped curve, goes down, not surprising that imports, shown here, has been going on. Although the United States is the biggest consumer, we also saw that it is not the major source of additional growth in global demand in the international petroleum market. That role is, is supplied by Asia, which again makes total sense because of their rapid industrialization. Possibly the greatest of all the great transformations taking place in human history is going on right now in Asia. In, and this translates into a, remark, a, a very remarkable increase in the demand for petroleum in these countries. Chinese, demand, Chinese per capita output, rough proxy for per capita income, has been going up. And this inevitably leads to a demand for petroleum. Of course, it leads to a demand for electricity, which in the case of China is largely supplied by coal, although they're working on renewables big time in wind and so forth. But it also leads to a big rise in the demand for petroleum. Just today, on the Xinhua News Service, which is the Chinese government's national news service, which is in, available in English, they have an article which says, you guys are not going to make us go back to riding bicycles. You get to ride around in cars. Why shouldn't we ride around in cars? And if you think about it, this is an argument that is difficult to counter. It's clear that this oil consumption is going to go up. Motor vehicle registration is rising, and that's just China which is a big player. India is also true, and there are a number of other very large countries where this is going on. So what does this mean? Rapid growth of energy combined with some sort of issues, a lot of strategic types worry about this. So rising incomes around the world means demand for energy goes up. Without enhanced efficiency, there's going to be increased pressure on prices, and international competition. So Donald Rumsfeld had this to say. We have this choice, and he's right. And remember, there's another dog that did not bark here. Energy conservation and the development of renewable energy. It's this concept from Sherlock Holmes, the dog that did not bark. What you learn is what didn't happen, as well as from what did happen. And what didn't happen 
and did not happen in the United States since the first big oil shock of 1973-4 was sustained policies to economize on fossil fuels, very much including petroleum. This seems to be the choice. And so that's not, we can see, I imagine, what choice we'd like. And we also see how different that is from the choices that have so far been made. All right. Now, we have to talk about the supply of petroleum. We're going to need a bunch of concepts to do this. We're going to need, need to know what reserves are. We're going to need to know what oil is in the first place, chemically, geologically. We're going to need to know some economic concepts, like economic rent. And we're going to need to know about some market structures because, to anticipate the bottom line, we want to tell a story that revolves around a global struggle over property rights over this enormously valuable resource. Well, the way I talk about this, it's a struggle for cash and control, a struggle for the money and a struggle for decision-making power around the utilization of this particular resource. So what is this stuff anyway? What is oil in the first place? Obviously, it's a flammable liquid, and it's located, crude oil, in and under rock. It's underground. Where did it come from? A long time ago in the Triassic and Jurassic periods, and it has a highly complex hydrocarbon structure. It all goes back to, mostly, to a thing in geological history called the Tethy Sea. It was so named in 1893 by a geologist named Edward Suisse, Edward Suisse named after, as often was the case, an ancient Greek god. There it was, during the Triassic, when these guys were roving around, it's a good thing we were just, our ancestors were tiny little insignificant shrew-like rats. Otherwise, we would have been made a very suitable lunch, and we wouldn't be here. Here's a cartoon version of oil formation. It's formed from the preserved remains of prehistoric zooplankton and algae, right? dead animals and plants. These things settle after death in a sea or a lake bottom under anoxic conditions. They get mixed with mud, they get buried, layers and layers pile up over the long sweep of geological time, and heat and pressure that results from those processes then changes the chemical structure, change the chemical structure of this stuff. And it gets trapped. What's an oil reservoir? All crude oil, that is, nearly all crude oil. There's some that comes from shale rock, but this is made. Come from reservoirs. What's this? The requirements for an oil reservoir geologically are complicated. You have to have thick layers of oil-rich source rock. You have to have that stuff that we just described, of all the dead animals and plants that are heated under pressure and so on. But there's got to be, the reservoir rock has to be porous enough so it can be gathered together, and then there's got to be something on the top that holds it there. All of this has got to be in the right position so it gets trapped. Pressurized, heated, just enough, but not too much. Pretty special requirements. So an oil reservoir, this is what an oil reservoir looks like. There's a trap here. There is the oil down here underneath is typically some water, and natural gas, if there is some, there often is, lies above it. Simpler schematic showing the same thing. The cap, the brine, the oil, the gas. Here's a useful metaphor. These two diagrams are actually a little bit misleading to us lay people, okay? Uh, because it looks like, well, it's kind of like a big swimming pool. You know, you go down and there's this big lake underneath. But actually, it's more like a sponge. Right? It's more like a sponge with gooey liquid trapped inside. So you know, like a sponge, there are these little pockets. But then there's also solid stuff that's sort of gooey, but not as gooey. Anyway, that's one geologist's description of it. The formation of reservoirs 
is a matter of extreme chance geologically. And all those conditions that we went through, any one of them is missing, too bad. Chances of their all being just right are relatively small. Why do we care? Because that implies, okay, this gives us a reason saying, oh yeah, it's geology that tends to create this stuff only in certain places. It's concentrated. This is a contingent phenomenon of Earth history. It's just the way it was. And we can go on from there. Not only is oil of any sort only found in certain places, but the concentration of oil in the Persian Gulf is even more special. This famous geologist, Kenneth Davis, uses this, who wrote his book, Beyond Oil, has this kind of metaphor. It's sort of like, you know, for you, you Angelinos know that, you know, people drive up and down I-5, going back and forth between the Bay Area and L.A., and sometimes there are accidents, and often, most of the time, there are no accidents. Every now and then, there is an accident, but it usually involves a car or two. And every once in a great while, in the fog, under bad conditions, you get one of those giant pileups. That, he said, is the equivalent of what happened in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf. It's a giant freeway pileup. All these conditions just happen to be just right. It's just the way blood is. What is this stuff chemically? Well, it's mostly carbon and hydrogen, hence the name hydrocarbon. It's typically referred to as hydrocarbons. There are other elements in smaller amounts. Sulfur is a particularly troublesome element because the higher the percentage of sulfur, I mean, sulfur is not nice when you burn it. It creates acute pollution. So oil that has relatively low sulfur content even has a name. It's called sweet crude. And this matters because consumers, particularly in places like Europe, where in the 1960s they were very concerned to switch over from coal burning, which was mingling with fog in places like London and creating huge pollution. They didn't want to then substitute oil that had a lot of sulfur in it, and we'll see that European demand for sweet crude, which just happened to be found abundantly in the country of Libya, helps to explain some of the dynamics that are critical in a fundamental revolution in the property rights over oil. So here's just another example. All of these details matter. They matter to the kind of story about who gets what and who gets killed and why they try to do it and what are the consequences of their trying to do it. All of this stuff matters. So. Here's this complex hydrocarbon stew. And the molecules, they vary from these relatively short molecules to these hugely long kinds of molecules. Two examples that everybody knows about, octane on the left, propane on the right, are just two examples. This is very complicated. So these different fields then, as I've already suggested, have, first of all, they're specialized. Most places in the world don't have them at all. When they do have them, they have very particular characteristics. Okay? They range in their quality and so forth. So we need to bear that in mind. And so it's just this little thumbnail sketch and apologies to earth scientists and geologists for this utter cartoon history. Uh, if my late father, who was a geologist, were alive, I'm sure he would be laughing hysterically at, at what I just did. But anyway, there it is. First thing to understand. The nature of oil itself, its the geologic basis for its, ge for its concentration, and the variations in quality of the stuff. Second thing to understand, the production process itself. How does this stuff get from the ground, formed long ago in geologic time, to then, via the mechanism of derived demand, be consumed by consumers? First stage, exploration and discovery. Obviously, you have to find the stuff. Second stage, you then have to produce it. You have to pump it out of the ground. You have to refine it, and each of these, then you have to market it. And each of these, uh, the second, third, and fourth stage are mediated by transportation. Here's a useful picture that shows you how it works. You have to find the stuff and then pump it. Then it has to be transported to refineries, which then has to be transported to marketing, so that consumers can use it. In talking about, for example, 
the dynamics of the history of the international oil business. We will see that one critical component, one way to tell this story, is that it is a constant struggle by certain agents, specifically by certain multinational corporations first, and then later nation states, to get a form of monopoly power in this process. Because you can make even more money than you can normally if you can create that monopoly power. So we will see there is this going to be this struggle about the creation and then the erosion of what economists call cartels. A cartel being, not as opposed to a monopoly, which is a single firm, a cartel is a group of firms that remain independent but come up with some kind of a deal <coughs> and much hinges on the kind of the deal, and can they enforce the deal, and do they know what the other side is doing in the deal, but trying to make a deal to act like a monopolist to make even more money. And we will see that it will matter that the different stages at which it is, which stage is relatively more vulnerable to cartel attack than to others. Notice another thing about this diagram. Exploring and, produ and producing oil, especially exploration, is not cheap. We'll talk about production in a minute. Refineries are, as you know, if you've ever driven by one, very large, very complicated sets of machinery. And marketing networks also require extensive numbers of sites. So what? So what? All of this requires investment. And investment takes time. So the oil business, the economics of the oil business is fundamentally characterized by leads and lags, another source, inherent source, built-in source of price instability. If you get an increase in the price and you say, oh, well, look, this means we need a less of this stuff or we have a surge in demand, it will take you time to build the refineries, to lay down the pipelines in order to get this stuff and to increase the marketing outputs. So on both the demand and the supply side of the market, there are inherent built-in features that generate price instability. Let's talk about each of the, I'm going to talk next about each of these production stages in turn. First, crude oil exploration and discovery. This is, to put it mildly, a very, very risky business. I mean, that follows in the geology. You don't know where it is. Geologists know a lot about the Earth's crust, but the Earth's crust is very large. And particularly, if technology, technological change over time only gradually allows them to look deeper and deeper in the Earth's crust, it's highly risky. The technology, especially these days, is highly dependent on seismography, that is, sending radar waves and listening to them, trying to figure out what's under there, and computer analysis. Here's a useful statistic. In the United States, so first, an explore, what's an exploration well? An exploration well is when you take one of those big rigs out and you drill, thinking that probably you're going to hit oil, because after all, you wouldn't do it if you didn't think there was some chance of finding oil. Right? So first of all, before you even drill an exploration well, you will have had to, you will have, you have in sense, you will have done extensive geological analysis. But even then, notice, only 1% of them in the United States found oil, and the United States is one of the best maps geologies in the world. Okay? Not that there isn't more to do, there always is. But compared to other parts of the world, it's the best map place. So, it's been compared to finding needles in haystacks. Here's a high resolution seismic section, 3,000 meters below the Gulf of Mexico. This is these little oil thing. So those schematic diagrams that are useful to kind of get the basic ideas, can be very deceptive. These things are very small and very hard to do. So it's very risky. And when the price of oil goes through the roof, lots and lots of people flock to try, who have the skills, flock in to try to look for oil. This happened in Texas and the Southwest and in California in the 1970s. People rushed in, lots of geologists, lots of engineers went in trying to find it. Some of them got really rich, most of them didn't. And then the bottom fell out of prices for reasons we'll talk about uh, in a little while. Not today, but subsequent lectures. And then they were left. So this is a risky business. Typically, typically, but not exclusively, 
Very large companies don't like to embrace highly risky activities. Now, oil is a partial exception. In the United States, it's true that a great deal of the looking for oil in the U.S. has been done by relatively small independent companies. But that has been changing over time as in order to look for oil, you require more and more complex technology, which is more and more expensive, which then has led to more and more investment on the part of the large companies. Okay, so it's expensive to find it, but once you find it, what happens? And this is a critical point. Once you found it, and you drill the well, and yes, the oil is there, what to do? <coughs> Nothing except run the pump. The pumps run on electricity or possibly diesel fuel, and they're just pumps. They're just like the pumps in the Imperial Valley to pump out groundwater. They're, they're just pumps. Right? The variable costs are very, very low. Once you've found oil, the costs of production are likely to be low, and we will see that this fact generates massive economic rents in this business, which in turn will have all kinds of consequences since we humans are a very <coughs> greedy primate. So that's crude oil. First of all, you've got to find it. And notice, to find it requires technology. Now, flip back and think, yeah, but I know that a lot of this stuff came from the Middle, comes from the Middle East. And I know that the great transformation in the Middle East has only just you know, begun fairly recently, not like the Europeans where it started before. And I know there was this huge disparity then in the technological capacity of the Europeans and of the people of the Middle East. And that was true with respect to military. Never fear, for we have got the Gatling gun, which they have not. And just as it was true in the military, so also was it true in geology and in the getting oil. So unsurprisingly, finding oil in the Middle East was initially not done by locals. It was done by the folks with skills who just happened to be folks associated with various European powers who had various designs of their own on the region. So from the very beginning, built into the nature of this commodity is our sources of conflict between nations and between peoples around this stuff. So the costs are minimal. Then, then you've got to refine it. What's this about? Here's an example, very large thing. Think of this as a giant kitchen, or maybe better, an enormous still. You know, like the whiskey stills that the folks in Appalachia used to make during Prohibition. Great big things to cook liquids and to boil them, and then you want to capture the stuff that boils off so they're covered with pipes and all that kind of stuff. What's going on here? Basically, the chemistry, again, very complex and detailed, but the basic idea is fairly straightforward. Different molecular chains gasify at different temperatures. We've seen that there are lots of differences in the quality of oil and different kinds of oils and different kinds of products that people want ranging all the way from highly volatile things that you could use in, in jet, as jet fuel to much less volatile stuff, to put it mildly, that you use to spread on roads to make asphalt. Okay. And there's everything in between. So you have to cook this stuff in the ground and draw off this different stuff in order to do this. You can look at this on ERES. It's more detail about the relationship between, inverse relationship between viscosity, volatility, and things like that. And the bottom line for us is, then this is one of the two aspects, supply and demand, that determine what's actually in, quote unquote, a barrel of oil. Well, that, we've talked a little bit about this in terms of demand. It depends on final demand patterns, and that's true. But it also depends on the nature of the oil itself. Okay? Because the kinds of products you can get is in part determined by the length of the number of the different kinds of molecules that are found in it and so on. Varies with the chemical composition, refining its efficiency and patterns of final demand. Here's an example. Here are two refineries from different kinds of crude oil. Here's a so-called very heavy crude. You'll hear this kind of term in the oil business all the time. What heavy crude means is it's an oil that has a high percentage of very long 
uh, molecules in it that therefore is typically better used, unless you want to cook it a long time, for siphoning off stuff that you can use uh, as uh, asphalt and stuff like that. All the way down to light, which is used much more useful for other kinds of things. So you get these different product yields from these different kinds of distillations. On average, the U.S. looks like this. Mostly, nearly half of what we do is, motor, is gasoline. There, then we get diesel oil, heavier oil, other kinds of stuff, and finally, residual fuel oil and aspect. What about the refining capacity in the world? Well, different ways of counting it. One way of counting it is to talk about capacity to distill crude, crude oil, but then, to make life even more complicated, there's a secondary process, which is typically called downstream processing, where there's more refined things are done in order, for example, to put certain additives in the fuel and the like. This gives you an idea. Here's where refineries are in North America, outside in, in, in Canada and the U.S. Now, you can immediately notice a couple of things here. Refineries in the U.S. are concentrated here, no surprise. And notice also, even in this area where there's a lot of oil working by the U.S., they're concentrated along the coast. This is because of transportation. They're located there because, as we're going to see in a minute, transporting this, there are two basic ways to transport it uh, for in these earlier stages, and that's pipelines and tankers. Uh, and notice they're also out here. Why are there refineries out here? Well, two reasons. One, there's some oil down here, as most of you know. And second, very large population centers. Now, for instance, there's no oil in New York City. There's none. There's no oil around here. But there's a refinery there. Why is that? Huge final demand, so it is profitable to come in with tankers and unload the stuff and then refine it right there. Refineries up here in the province of Alberta, which is also a major oil producer, and that's kind of the pattern that we can see. Where are these more specifically? Concentrated in the Gulf Coast, or Texas and Louisiana, which is where oil is, and then spread around depending on location of final demand. U.S. refining capacity, notice, has not changed very much. Interesting. The so way in which the capacity of refinery hasn't changed and capacity utilization hasn't been all that different either. What about transportation? For large volumes, there are basically only two ways to do this. You can put it in great enormous boats called tankers or you can put it through pipelines. For short distances, of course, final products, gasoline, you use trucks because of the diversity of places that it has to go. But in terms of crude oil and basic refined products, a lot of this moves through pipelines. And crude oil almost exclusively moves through pipelines and oil tanks. Oil flows in the world are a very big deal. Right? They go all over the world, and these are very considerable distances, so we want to know how they get there. Let's think about pipelines, for example. About two-thirds of all liquid fuel used in the U.S. moves through these things. That's 13 billion barrels a year. We have 90,000 kilometers of trunk pipelines, which means the big ones, and another 65,000 kilometers of smaller ones. These things are all over the place. It's a network that goes all over the world. We'll look at a map in a minute. In Russia, there are 94,000 kilometers of pipelines. Most of the oil in Russia moves through pipelines. Russia is still the largest oil producer in the world. What are the advantages of pipelines? Why is this the case? It's very simple. It's the cheapest to transport by far, and there is a straightforward reason why you get more and more of them. They move 20% of the freight tonnage, but they only account for 2% of the costs. Why are they so cost-effective? Simple. The cost of a pipeline is basically the cost of making a pipe. And the cost of making a pipe is basically the cost of the tube, right? which is a function of its diameter. The money you get depends on what you put through the tube, which is a function of volume. And since diameters, volumes are bigger than diameters, there is a built-in 
economy of scale, sometimes this is used in elementary economics textbooks to talk about technological sources of economies of scale, and it's a big deal in pipelines. Where are they? This shows the network of pipelines in North America. Highly concentrated down here to move it around the refineries, but the entire country and up into Canada is crisscrossed with this network. And the Russians have something similar, although not as dense, certainly not as dense for secondary. It's much more concentrated. And the Middle East, you will not be surprised to learn, also has pipelines. If a lot of oil is produced right around in here, then you want to get it to the Mediterranean, you want to get it to the sea lanes, or if you have oil and natural gas up here, somehow you need to get it out that way to consumers in Europe, or get it that way to consumers in Asia, or get it that way to put it on boats to take it to Asia. So in fact, there are a lot of pipelines running around, or being built, or being planned in the region. Hmm. Here's one example. This pipeline, the idea is, there's oil over here in Kazakhstan, the idea is, well, wouldn't it be nice if you could take that oil out without going through two countries that you don't like, without going through Russia and without going through Iran. And so to do this, money is made to try to pump it through Azerbaijan and into Georgia and then into Turkey, but you're taking it through Georgia, which happens to have a dispute with Russia. And Russia may not be too impressed by your desire to take the oil out and not use it. their pipelines. And for other reasons having to do with states and nationalism and the like, they, the Georgians, may get into a shooting war, as happened very recently. And then the pipeline gets disrupted, and there are issues. So that's one pipeline in the news. Let's look at a second pipeline in the news. Just recently, that is, in December of last year, a new gas pipeline from this country, a little with a small population, former Soviet Union country called Turkmenistan, has gigantic natural gas reserves, has been ruled, was ruled by a really, really strange man. Uh, for a while he died, his son has taken over, a really weird personality called for life, never mind. The Chinese have built a pipeline to take this natural gas into China. Remember, the demand for energy in China is huge and continue, will continue to grow. So naturally, they look for sources of this stuff that anybody else would do. And so they just opened this kind of pipeline. And last but not least, note here the dashed line. This dashed line means that it hasn't been built. There's an idea of a proposed gas line from Turkmenistan to go through Afghanistan and then into Pakistan and then down here. Now, why wouldn't you want to build a pipeline I mean, like this? Well, because it goes through Iran. We don't like Iran, so we want to bring it through Afghanistan. But of course, that hasn't been built. Because if you build pipelines, remember, these things are very long. They go all over the place. And of necessity, they have to go in all kinds of places where population densities may be very low. It's not very, you don't have to be much of a military expert to realize that you can turn them into military targets. This is made to order for, for small-scale warfare and for non-state actors to try to blow these things up. This shows a U.S. Marine in front of a burning pipeline in Iraq during the height of the violence there. Now, so what? Some people think these pipelines are really critical in explaining the current politics of the region. People like who? This guy. His name is Mr. Craig Murray. He's currently the rector of Dundee University, University of Dundee in Scotland. But that wasn't his job a while ago. He used to be the United Kingdom's ambassador to the Central Asian country of Uzbekistan, a very repressive Stalinist-like regime. He was removed by the British government in 2004 for revealing British complicity with torture as part of the extraordinary renditions program that was set up after 9-11. What does Mr. Murray have to say about all this? He alleges that in the late 1990s, the Uzbek ambassador to the U.S. met with the then governor of Texas, a certain George W. Bush, to discuss a pipeline. There were agreements. Enron, uh, you may not have heard of Enron. It disappeared uh, in a corruption scandal some years ago but it was very large at the time, trying to get its hands on natural gas. 
And there was a oil company, which has since been absorbed by other companies, was working on developing this pipeline, and the consultant was a man named Hamid Karzai, who is the pre pre currently the president of Afghanistan. So this guy says, you know, if you look at the deployment of U.S. forces, position to guard, his opinion is it's about the money, it's about the oil, it's about the pipelines, it's not about anything else. Now, it's true that if you look where U.S. troops are stationed and where the violence is in the, the red, and we're typically down here, although we have some folks up in the north, and yes, it's true that along the line of this pipeline there's a lot of violence and a lot of American soldiers, but you want to beware of the kind of post hoke proctor hoke fallacy, after which, because of which. Hmm. Maybe, maybe this has something to do with it, but how much does it have to do with it? And this is the challenge throughout this class of thinking about in what sense we shed blood for oil. What is the specific linkage between oil and violence? This is something that has to be thought about very carefully. There are many possibilities, but getting the specifics down and being able to defend those specifics against skeptics who would say, well, yeah, but they can get the oil lots of other ways, and they can do it this way, or what about something else? Why this particular decision requires an extended defense. Let's talk about oil tankers. These are big things. Two-thirds of Saudi oil, for example, is moved through tankers. These things are extremely large, as I'll illustrate in a moment. After 1956, again, because of political developments which then impacted the geography of transportation, which affected costs, which then led to an economic response, you get an increase in the size of tankers. When the Suez Canal was closed for eight years, again as a result of the Middle Eastern War, this gave further incentives for extremely large boats. And these huge boats now transport about one-third of all the oil in the world. Now, environmentalists should care about this a lot. Why? Super tankers. I don't know if anybody's ever seen one of these things, but when they're fully loaded, their draw is up to 100 feet of water. That means the weight of what they put in displaces 100 feet of water. They go down 100 feet. They can come into port with about two feet separating their, their bottom from the bottom from the bottom of the harbor. Because they're so large, it, if they're at cruising speed, stopping them can take up to three miles. Think of big trucks putting on the brakes. It's just simple physics. It takes them longer to brake. What, how do they do this? They have to kick their engines into full reverse, which means if you try to brake a big tanker, it's very hard to steer, right? That's why they always tell you if you're in a skid, right, you don't slam on the brakes, maybe, and you don't, you let maybe give it a little bit of gas because when you're there, you're going forward, there is more control. The same thing, with some changes, is true with boats. So they're very, very difficult to steer. What do they look like? Basically, they look like this. There's a fuel tank that runs the thing, it's an engine, and there's a bridge, this is where all the sailors are and where the captain is. There's nothing up here, it's just empty space. And then they have these great big oil tanks. And then there's a hull underneath it. How big are they? These things are longer than the Empire State Building is tall. They're huge, really, really enormous. Right? These are gigantic, enormous boats. And why are they so big? Because of economies of scale. In a world where the risks to the environment are not priced. Therefore, it makes every sense economically to calculate. Now, there are two kinds of hulls to these boats. Remember here we've got this hull, and this one is said, well that's a double hull, and that's good, because there are two kinds of hulls. There's a single bottom, where it's just one hull, just one sheet of metal. And a double hull means one sheet and then another sheet above that. Basically, single hulls are floating balloons. Right? 
metal balloons. Right? Given the weight, given the volume of the oil in it, they're floating balloons. There's a cost, though, versus risk trade-off, once again. And the risk of environmental damages is not price, is not part of the economic consideration. So unsurprisingly, firms make decisions that some of us find problematic. Let's take the famous case of the Exxon Valdez. This was one of these giant super tankers. And what happened to it? Well, it ran aground in Prince William Sound in Alaska in March of 1989. It spilled 11 million gallons of crude. That's a lot of crude. 11 million gallons. And there were endless lawsuits. The state of Alaska did a class action suit, pioneered a methodology, some of you studied, they tried to figure out what were the damages. And this is why it happened. The oil wasn't, wasn't produced in Prince William Sound. The oil in Alaska is produced on the North Slope under extremely, to put it mildly, harsh climatic conditions. And there's a pipeline, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, that brings that oil down to the port of Valdez, where then the super tankers can come in, because it's an ice-free port typically, and they can come in and, un and unload it. And this just shows a more detailed sort of thing. It was spilled here, and then shows how it spread these lines, showing the spread of the oil, oil slicks all over the place. So there was a final decision. What happened? 20, on behalf of 22,000 Alaskans, 22,000 citizens of Alaska signed or participated in one form or another, and they were the plaintiffs, and the state of Alaska took Exxon to court, and a lower court fined Exxon for $2.5 billion. <coughs> Needless to say, Exxon did not accept this, and Exxon appealed and kept on appealing. Now, appeals of this court, so sort, have two functions. The first function is to exhaust the opposition because Exxon, as you will see in a while, has deeper pockets than anybody else. They are, by most accounts, the largest or the second largest corporation in the United States. So they have extremely deep pockets. So you can exhaust the opposition. But the other reason is that they know perfectly well that over the last 30 years, of the kinds of things we talked about as we looked at American nationalism, the nature of the, of the courts themselves has become more and more and more and more favorable to corporate interests, as we just as you just saw in that article that I emailed you, the URL, about the recent Supreme Court case, that corporations can spend any amount of money in elections they want, no problem. I mean, my colleague Paul Ludbeck has a, what I think is a very good suggestion. I think all this is very inefficient in economic terms. I mean, if we're going to auction things off, why don't we just put up senatorial races on eBay? You know, just put them up on eBay, put them up someplace like that, and just sell them off directly. You know, it's easy to show in economics it would be a more efficient auction mechanism, but never mind. And sure enough, they cut, the Supreme Court cut the damages from $2.5 billion to $507.5 million. Hmm. Mr. Lee Raymond, shown here, who's the CEO at the time, he retired, and what did he get? He got $400 million, including stock options in his retirement package, nearly equal to this sum. $1 million consulting gear, two years of security, car driver, etc., etc. As the great singer of my generation said, money doesn't talk, it swears. Uh, that's really what happened. So, these oil spills are a low probability, but very de highly devastating impact event. These tankers can hold up to 68,000 gallons. These are the bigger ones. In other words, there are lots of tankers out there that are six times bigger than the Exxon Valdez. They're very large. There is, their spillage is more rare than from other boats, but it's much more serious. So what kind of laws do we have to regulate this? Well. We've seen that in the case of the United States, the regulatory framework is pretty deficient. I mean, it's a big problem, right? I mean, you can have a gigantic oil spill and the total cost is maybe 500 million. That sounds like a lot of money to us, but it's not a lot of money to the first or second largest corporation in the United States. They would prefer not to incur those losses. But nevertheless, okay, it's not a big deal. But that's in the United States, globally. The situation is much worse than this, because for all the faults 
that are increasing, alas, of our political and legal system. Nevertheless, we have a much more developed set of laws and rules and regulations, and the rule of law is somewhat better here than in many other parts of the world. And you will see in a moment in the next slide that a very large percentage of these super tankers are not registered in the United States. So what? Because so what means, um, that means under what nation's laws, to what nation's laws are they subject to regulation? If you're an American boat, then American courts will apply, but otherwise others. And where are they right, Where are they located? Well, some of them are U.S. boats. Some of them are in the U.K. But then there are places like the Bahamas, the Marshall Islands, Liberia. Notice the big share of Liberia. Why do we care about Liberia? Liberia, for a number of years, essentially did not have a government. There was no government. There was a civil war. There was all kinds of ethnic cleansing and violence. There was no government. So there were no regulations. Great place to register your tanker. Panama, also not noted for its stringent enforcement of international rules. The Chinese have basically for their own use. The Russians. So you can see from this that a large number of these are located in what are called flags of convenience. It's the flag of convenience idea of where you register the boat that then helps to determine what happens. Now, there's recently been an innovation in the oil business in terms of the linkages of these different production stages, largely because technology recently, for the first time, has really allowed us to exploit oil offshore. It's been going on for a generation. But, of course, it, the challenges technologically, both in finding it and in pumping it out, are much greater than onshore. And a lot of offshore oil has recently been discovered off the west coast, west coast of Africa. So increasingly there is this thing called floating production, storage, and offloading. How does this work? Here you've got these offshore rigs that are drilling and pumping it up. Then they're connected by basically pipes of one sort or another. Sometimes they store them in these giant floating containers out there on the ocean. And then they come in to this place that is basically like a floating dock. Because what happens is that the super tankers will come up alongside this thing, and then this stuff stored here or here, pumped here, is then pumped onto it. Now this is very attractive to some people. Because notice its concentration down here. This is in this Many of the governments here, to put it very mildly, are at best unstable and at worst non-existent. So if you want to pump out oil, then it seems like it's a better deal for you to do it offshore, where it's a lot easier to defend because it's offshore. Oh yes, there are pirates, but then there's the US Navy. And so again, you sort of see some of these connections, potential connections, beginning to emerge about the way oil is moved, and the use of force around it. Next thing we need to talk about in transportation are things called choke points. Where this stuff goes, of course, depends on the geography of where it's first produced and the final market. And these tankers pass through some very narrow places, like the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Malacca between Sumatra and the Malayan part of Malaysia, the Panama Canal, the Suez Canal. And we will see, I've already alluded, to the way in which changes in these places, like the Suez Canal, that are driven by military contingencies, by wars, then have a major knock-on effect on the, on the nature of the game in the international oil business. The same would be true for the Panama Canal, but the Panama Canal being in the Western Hemisphere, mostly the Americans don't worry about this, but these two places people worry about a lot more, particularly the Strait of Hormuz. Where is it? It's right here. It's this little bridge between Iran and the United Arab Emirates, very narrow kind of place that goes through there, and a vast amount of the world's oil goes through here because it's concentrated there. Now, one of the reasons, there are a long list of reasons, and I'll go into them as we go through the course, 
hopefully in the last lecture about a country of Iran, there are many, 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 many reasons why the United States getting into a war with Iran would be an extremely stupid and destructive thing to do. But one of the reasons is just given by this simple geography. It's strange credulity to think that it would not have some impact on shipping. And if you like the recent price of, of, of oil, wait until you see something that happens to the Strait of Hormuz. Man, it would have major consequences. What about the Strait of Malacca? It's right here. This gap in Asia it has to come in there. And so naturally, lots of people are concerned about the way oil moves there, particularly Asian consumers. They're very concerned to make sure, which is why countries like China and Japan make it a point to have excellent relations with the government of Indonesia and the government of Malaysia and to help them if they have local trouble to make sure that trouble does not happen. If you look at the retail price of gas, we already know this as we now turn to marketing. I'm not going to say a lot about marketing because we talk more about marketing than the demand side. But you already know the taxes are a pretty small part of what we in America pay. It hasn't changed very much. Now, I've said it's highly concentrated geographically. How do we know? Where is it? Let's talk about this. The basic, here's a schematic by country. There are a set of different producers. The North Sea, basically the Norwegians and the British, are small-scale producers of petroleum. That's the North Sea. The Canadians produce oil in various places. Of course, the United States produces oil in all of those states shown in red. Sometimes it's rather small amounts, but that's the United States. Then it's produced in various countries in South America, especially in, this, in Mexico and Venezuela. A little oil is produced in some of these other countries, but not much. Lots of it is produced in Russia and Kazakhstan. And then notice the blue. The blue is for something called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And we don't know yet what OPEC is, but we'll find out today what this is, why it matters, how it came into being, and why it's so crucial to understanding the dynamics of the oil business. There is this notion in this graph called estimated <coughs> ultimate recovery. And we're going to have to talk a lot about this. What we need to do is first just give a little quick sketch of what, where we think most of the oil is, but remember, where we think most of the oil is, is a ge geological hunch. It may be a very good hunch, but still, by virtue of the fact that it's under the ground, we don't actually know it, where it is, and even if we're using it, we don't really know how much is there and how much of it we can get out. Okay? So we'll talk about that in a minute. There is a concept of proven oil reserves. We don't know yet what reserves are. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Because it's the critical category that is used to talk about how much oil there is out there in the world. I sort of like this map that takes countries and scales them, not by their geographic extent, but by the amount of oil they have. Just notice this. Here's Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran and the United Arab Emirates, these five really dwarf most other people. Now, Russia may be the biggest producer, but people are not at all sure that it has the greatest reserves. Here's a pie graph. And so, one way to think about this is maybe two-thirds, people argue about this a lot, anywhere from half to two-thirds of the reserves in the world are in the Middle East, which has a somewhat elastic definition. And here are the Saudi, notice this, Saudi Arabia. We're going to see in this class that it is quite impossible to understand anything, anything at all, about the international oil business without understanding something about Saudi Arabia. You can't do it, and this is why. Because of the size of its reserves, and we will see another reason why it, this is the case. Again, another guess from a European management consultancy firm that tries to say, well, again, Middle East, about two-thirds of all the reserves. Just looking at the Persian Gulf, 
notice the following. This is a somewhat lower estimate of their total reserves. And notice reserves exceed their production by quite a lot. Notice especially for future reference the far right excess production capacity. This will be crucial in terms of understanding the dynamics of price. Why do we care so much? Because if you can get an agreement among the folks that have most of the oil on the planet, who happen to be sovereign states who don't like each other, but if they can do a deal and try to act in concert in the international market, and they have excess production capacity, and we already know that demand is highly inelastic, by varying their production, and they are really among the only people who can do this, they can have an impact on the price. And they, and only they, can have that kind of impact on the price. We'll talk about that. That's what's one of the things that is so critical about open. What about oil fields? Well, there are a lot of them. One estimate, about 40,000 of these things. But 94% of the oil, over 9 out of 10 barrels, we think, is in 1,500 of these giant and major oil fields. The largest field in the world, of Awad, in Saudi Arabia, was discovered over half a century ago, has been pumping ever since, and holds officially 75 to 83 billion barrels of oil. It's huge. Where is it? It's right here a very large and long place. Where are these very large fields located? Answer, the Persian Gulf. This is where most of them are. This is the world's largest oil field. Now, why do we care about that? We care about it because of the size of reserves gives them, as we'll see, certain leverage in the international market. But also, Remember the argument about once you find this stuff and drill for it, then the costs of production are minimal. Now it will turn out that not only was geography kind to the Persian Gulf in terms of putting a great deal of this stuff there, but it was doubly kind to the Persian Gulf because, for geological reasons, the costs of production are the lowest in the world. The stuff tends to be under pressure, it's close to the surface. It's extremely cheap to pump the stuff out, and this will give them important source, a source of important wealth and a source of important bargaining power in the international market. Let's talk about these super giant fields. What are they? Five billion barrels. There are 34 of them, and notice where they are. There are five in Russia, and 20 of them or in the Persian Gulf, of which notice not coincidental. Five are in Iraq. Hmm. Hmm. And five are in Iran. Hmm. We're going, we're beginning now to track in what way, what is this link between oil and the United States and Iraq? How do we think about this? How can we make sense of it? It's a different picture, same idea. Middle East has most of these things, giant oil fields are located and concentrated in OPEC countries and in particular in the Middle East. Okay, now, I keep using this term reserves, and we have to talk about this. How is this calculated? How do you know what reserves are? Let's talk about how reserves change. Well, of course, if you discover new oil, that will increase your reserves. If you have an existing field and you think you can extend it a little further than you thought, and then there are revisions in what you think, you know, improvements in GM, GL, and seismic technology, you may <coughs> minus oil production, right? I mean, after all, no more oil is being made by geology or insignificant quantities relative to uh, what we consume. So it's there when we start to drill it out. And then as we drill more and more of it out, reserves should go down, right? I mean, it's sort of a zero-sum game. I mean, it's, it's just simple arithmetic. 
But actually, that's not what goes on in the world of data. Reserves are hard to figure out. There's a lot of geological uncertainty about it, and there are incentives to lie. Big incentives, both on the side of companies and on the side of countries. Now, this is often ignored. And again, it's one of these emperors have no clothes kind of thing. We don't talk about this, but let's do talk about it. The popular image sort of goes like this. It says, well, this is what we discovered. And every time we discover, we just add. <coughs> but we don't ever subtract for the stuff we're pumping out. That's actually what goes on a lot of the time. We don't actually do this. Reserves are a highly contested number. Some people say this is what happens. Some people say it's more like this because you've got to subtract the production from the discovery. But in all cases, you're adding and subtracting from estimates because nobody actually knows what's actually there. So what incentives do people have to distort their reserves? Well, first, let's look at oil companies. Shell Oil Company, for example, stunned the city of London, the financial center, the British company, by admitting after an audit that 1.4 billion <coughs> barrels had been wrongly classified as crude. What happened? The stock price fell. No surprise there. Oil in the ground is an asset. Stock price is in part determined by assets. If all of a sudden it turns out your assets are less than you claim, people say, well, this company has fewer assets, I don't want it. And you dump it, and the price goes down. So companies have an incentive to do this. This is, well, of course, companies have incentive to do this all the time. And yet, of course, we have various rules about disclosure, securities and exchange commissions, and so on and so forth. But we don't really have this in the case of geology because, of course, there's a great deal of debate about this. This was in 2005. Looking at what impacts, again, from a management consultancy in the UK, looking at what happens here, correlation between relative change in various variables and share price, your reserve base. Positive growth in reserves. Uh, if you say your reserves went up 10%, turns out, look, your share price goes up by 5%, and it's symmetric. If your reserve base, oops, sorry, we overestimated, goes down by 10%, your stock price falls by 5%. Not good for you if you're a manager. Not good for you if you're a shareholder. So reserves matter to the private sector. <coughs> what about the organization of petroleum exporting countries? Here is a very clear example of how this happened. In 1987, four OPEC countries, those four, suddenly announced big increases in their oil reserves. Iran said their, their oil reserves went up 90%. Big increase. Iraq said, oh, our reserves have gone up by 112%. Okay. This was, to put it mildly, rather fishy. Why? Because at the time, these countries were locked in a brutal war, very similar to World War I, with trench warfare, with scud missiles hitting each other's cities, with about a million casualties summed on both sides. So you said they, these were relatively poor countries. So where did they get the money to go exploring for this stuff? And who was actually doing this exploring? And it turns out, well, no, no actual foreign firms were actually doing it. And so it looked very suspicious. It was largely thought that they made it up. And why did they do that? Because in OPEC, as we'll see, for reasons of the way OPEC functions in the international market, there are quotas allocated to each country to divide to then sum to the total amount that OPEC will produce. The formula, which of course, because these are sovereign states, has to be negotiated among these countries. One element in the negotiation was, well, the bigger your reserves, the bigger your share, the bigger your quota of OPEC production, therefore the bigger your revenue. And when this became part of the way they were they were going to determine quotas, all of a sudden there was a rush to declare larger reserves. So, moral to the story, be very careful about reserves. They're like a lot of things in global data. The data aren't all that great, but they're the only data we have. Okay? And we have to do our best, but it's always important to be aware of the limitations of this kind of data. <coughs>
We know already that that's where it is, mostly in the Middle East. Gives you a sense of, here shows this suspicious rise, right? All of a sudden, OPEC changes the rules and boing, up it goes. Hmm, we think, that's pretty suspicious. We're not sure we really believe this. OPEC share is large. The reserves are concentrated. Here they are again, Middle East. So we know right away we have, we're beginning to get these elements of instability and elements of conflict. We have this resource that is geographically concentrated. It tends to be concentrated particularly in a region of the world which has come late to the Great Transformation, but which is undergoing it now, and which has historically had very difficult relations with Europeans and then later Americans. We know that those Europeans also and Americans were among the first people involved in creating the oil business in the first place because of the requirements of a high degree of technology. And we also know that this has shifted over time as the international balance of power has shifted around, as the game of big game of nations has been going on with oil lacing all the way through it, and the Middle East is a very big deal in the whole picture. Basically, oil in the Middle East, there are some minor players like the Algerians and the Libyans, but the big, the big three, are well, really the big four, are the Saudis, the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Kuwaitis, and the United Arab Emirates. Notice that the Saudis, the Iraqis, the Iranians, and the Kuwaitis have been at the center of major political violence for quite a long time, at least 20 years. Okay? We want to see how that's connected to the oil business. African reserves are growing. And one of the reasons, remember we had that graphic about all the bases the United States had and these things called sinks, these command and control ideas, the areas of responsibility of the Pentagon. And very recently an Africa command has been created. One of the reasons that many analysts think the Africa command has been created is given by this diagram, the rising amount of oil being found in Africa. Europe's a little odd because it's mostly the Soviet Union, then it falls apart, and inside the Soviet Union is mostly Russia. Nice little map graph with a map that gives you a sense. The Persian Gulf is the big one. Now, how much oil is left? What we want to do is turn to a debate. A debate about, it's called the peak oil debate. Now notice from the beginning, I would just caution, this is an area, there are many others, but this is an area where dogmatism is most inappropriate. You already know that the answer to this question is nobody knows. Nobody knows. I mean, why? Well, because we don't know how much there is in the first place. We've already seen that in the case of reserves, in the case of estimates. So the truth is, we don't actually know. But of course, this never stops experts from getting into debates. And we want to talk about this debate just as a guide to the peak oil debate. Now, one measure of how much oil we have left is the simplest measure. What you do is you take the estimate of reserves and you divide it by the amount consumed a year, and then you get the number of years left. Okay. So this says, well, at current rates of consumption, the oil in OPEC will last for 84 years, and in the rest of the world, it will last for 26 years. If you're a policy planner in Washington, you will care about this, because OPEC makes decisions based on the interests of OPEC. And some of these countries may or may not be particularly friendly to the United States. A number of them are not particularly friendly. But we'll see that they have some reason not to be particularly friendly. But that's the situation. So that's one kind of measure. It's a metric from a book. Simple metric. Just saying how many years, doing this very, very simple kind of calculation. Right? Very, very simple. And most people think it's much too simple, but it's often used. People will take the, the base and then do this reserve to production ratio over here, 
And again, you get this kind of picture. Again, that if you believe, then, that the reserves... But notice what the calculation here is. The calculation says that the reserves we have now, we just take that number and divide by production over time, and that gives us the number of years. That says, necessarily, that we don't believe there will be additional reserves discovered. And that, clearly, is much too simple an argument. So we have to get more complicated. And this leads to the famous notion of Hubbard's Peak. You may have heard of this. Let's talk about what it is, what it might tell you, what it might not tell you, and again, just do a tour of the debate. Who is this guy? Well, he was a New Yorker, a feisty New Yorker named M. King Hubbard. He worked uh, for, uh, at the time, uh, Standard Oil uh, of New Jersey, now, now Exxon. And he was a geologist. And in 1956, he made a presentation to a geological survey meeting in San Antonio, Texas. And his, advice, his superiors pleaded with him not to do it, but he was the kind of guy who said, you know what, boss, this is just too important, I'm going to do it anyway. And he did. He was like that. And this was his argument. He said, well, if you look at an individual well, an individual field, and they had lots of data about this because these are U.S. producers, you would see that there would be this dramatic increase in production, and then it would fall. And he argued that production peaked when about half of the total oil in a reservoir was used up. So that's what an individual well looked like. It might be kind of flat and then go down. It might go up and then be flat and come way down quickly. It might be different. But if you then take all these individual wells and sum them up, then you got a picture of oil production in the United States, he argued. So what he argued was that it would look like this. So when half was produced, then you would begin to get this decline. So what was he basically doing methodologically? Like population biologists, he made the not unreasonable assumptions that initial exponential growth rates were not sustainable. You could not go on and get them. He showed that once the rate slowed down, you could predict where it would stop altogether. But he assumed this bell-shaped curve. Right? Didn't actually demonstrate it with data, but it made a strong case for it. And then he said, the total amount of oil extracted parallels oil discovery, but of course with a lag. And that's what he said. This is in 1956. Now, when he said this in 1956, as I said, his bosses were not pleased. People laughed at him, and they said, no, 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 he's crazy, who knows, he drinks too much, he's just a generally strange guy, but look at what happened to U.S. oil production. Here's Hubbard, talking back here. Right? So, this was the experience in the U.S. until he wrote. And then it continued to increase, and then, with a blip here for discoveries in Alaska and the North Slope, hmm, doesn't look too different from what he was talking about, particularly when you get rid of Alaska and just look at the lower 48. It does indeed bear some similarities to Hubbard's kind of curve. Now, here are a couple slides from an advocate of this, hence the term peak oil. That's where the peak is. The peak is, the idea is, is that this is what is the kind of typical pattern of oil production out of a given well, and then when you sum those wells out of a given country or region or whatever or, or whatever you're talking about. And he argued that it has this peak-like shape. It has sort of like a bell curve. It goes up, and then it goes down. Now, an advocate of this peak oil, a man named Jack Zagar, has this kind of graph where he talks about it. He says, well, look here. Look at these green things, these green bars. What are these? These are discoveries in the U.S. in the 1930s, as we'll see in the, in the, when I talk about the history of the international oil business. There were a huge set of discoveries, late 20s and the 1930s, in East Texas, Oklahoma, and that region of the country. That's where the Texas oil business really came from. Very large discoveries. And then oil production goes up. And notice that the, there are some discoveries, but they trail off. Peak discovery, 1930. Peak production, 41 years later, so oil production after discovery rises, there's a lag, 
and then it declines. That's for the U.S. Peak oil advocates then take this argument and generalize it to the world. This is what the peak oil view really says. They say, well, if we look at past discoveries, these bars, over time, notice when discoveries peak in the world. There's a big surge here at the end of World War II, finding lots of oil in Saudi Arabia, for example. Some is found back here. Then another big surge here, and then some discoveries, but it trails off. This black curve shows production. And so the peak oil people think that the future might look like this. Here are the discoveries. It keeps going up, but at some point with a lag, it's bound to go down, or at least that's the argument. Summarize this way. Here shows the wells that are being drilled, discovery and production globally. Here's discovery minus production, where discovery is less than what's being pumped out of the ground. And so they think this situation for the U.S. is what's likely to happen in the world. In other words, they are positing that this will happen, just as it did in the U.S. Here's another graph on a smaller time scale, more recently, that tries to make something like that argument. This graph is useful for showing, you know, we're talking about huge geologic and economic forces. And so a big battle, lots of stuff. And when, when they first discovered oil in Prudhoe Bay up in the north slope of Alaska, there was all this talk, you know, by now you should know, the emperor never has any clothes, he walks around naked, and everyone cheers. And they said, oh, we found all this oil, our oil problems are over. Hmm, yes, well, notice what happened, right? Production actually was just a little blip. When people talk to you about, oh, we'll solve our oil problems by drilling offshore, offshore in the U.S. is going to be less significant than Prudhoe Bay, almost certainly, it may not. But even if it is as big, notice it doesn't have a huge impact. So that's the, that's the peak oil argument. Needless to say, this argument doesn't go without rebuttals. There's a rejoinder. And the counter-arguments are various. Here's one counter-argument. Basically says, look, if you begin to run out of the stuff, the price will go up, and then this will stimulate innovation, it will stimulate discovery, and we already know that there's a lot about geology we don't know, so we're going to find more of it, and as we find more of it, then that will take care of it. Sometimes they say maybe there'll be some technological change on the demand side, you know, so that's, the market will take care of it. Then they say, and here historically they have some justification for saying this, that there have been other times in, the, in modern history when people have talked about variously the world or the United States running out of oil. During, at the end of World War I, for example, there was a kind of a panic about all of a sudden, we were running out of oil. The economic historian Alan Olmsted, the Davis, has written about this. There was this kind of panic about this, but it didn't actually prove to be real. And so on and so forth. In the, in the 1970s, there was a lot of talk about how that's the reason the oil prices are going up. It's not market dynamics. We're running out of oil. And that, too, didn't prove to be so. They also, critics also say, look, there are leads and lags here. Maybe the reason for the slowing down in production has to do with decisions that were made in the past. Notice what we're seeing globally. In the last 10 years or so, there hasn't been much change. Well, as we'll see later, from 1986 to 1998, the price of oil was very low. And perhaps maybe then, given that the price was low, very few investments were made, which then with the lag translates into very little additional production. So maybe there's a non-geologic but rather an economic explanation for some of this data. And indeed, maybe there are other reasons why these investments weren't made. Maybe some of these reasons have to do with politics and with nations that have a lot of oil not wanting to let foreigners look for it and things of that nature institutional barriers to investment, they would argue, may be part of the picture. 
Here's a graph that is at least consistent with that argument. This red line in economics, all you ever care about is real. You never care about nominal unless you're a macroeconomist talking about inflation. This is controlled for inflation, and there hasn't been a great deal of additional investment. It's relatively flat, which then might be what we want to look for rather than geology to explain it. Needless to say, however, peak oilers are not having any of this. They say, look, what about the 1980s, early 80s? There were very high prices, unprecedentedly high prices until a couple of years ago, and that, that didn't last as long. And yet, despite that, there was very little discovery. Huge rents, as we'll see. The incentives to find oil have always been large. The price is much less important than you think. And there have been gigantic improvements in technology, just huge in terms of size, size, in terms of seismography and in terms of computer analysis. And yet, despite these enormous changes, relative to the magnitude of those changes, the amount of new oil that's been found doesn't seem so great. And then they said, look, since when do economists not believe in diminishing returns? It is an interesting feature that geologists split on the peak oil question, and, and at least as far as I can tell. But most of the peak oil advocates tend to be geologists, and certainly most economists don't like it. So it's a geologist versus economist. That's too simple. But there is some of this. And so the rejoinder is, look, you economists believe in diminishing returns everywhere else. So how, how about not here? So they say, lower 48, look, all of these good things were available in the US. Perfect conditions in terms of technology, in terms of legal structure, and yet, nevertheless, it wasn't found. Well, the skeptics say, yeah, but the stuff already discovered will rise. Nobody knows the total amount. So we can't actually calculate Hubbard's curve to begin with. And higher prices will induce demand. So that's the debate. It goes back and forth and back and forth. Now, one question to ask is, does it matter? Because whatever the case, if we burn more of this stuff, this will accelerate global climate, climate change. So there is a sense in which the peak oil debate is fundamentally a sideshow. It's not nearly as important as this other one. But in politics, perceptions matter as least as much as realities, whatever that is. So, if decision makers happen to believe in peak oil, then they might behave in a certain way. If you were Richard Cheney, for example, and you seem to believe in peak oil, and you see soaring demand in Asia, you might think like this. It's a very simple view that says rising demand combined with peak oil, whether real or perceived, could be something that then generates political pressure for oil wars. Two of the world's largest companies just a few days ago pledged to rebuild the oil industry in Iraq to make it, they are hoping, even larger than Saudi Arabia. They said after all this disruption, this would be an important contribution to notice plugging the expected gap between supply and demand. He thinks the gap is likely to be very large. Now that's suggestive, but again, beware of just because it happens afterwards, that's the causal explanation. Okay, we'll continue this next time. If you need to turn in